Hi, welcome to Dermcast TV. Today we're going to talk about a very important topic, rare inflammatory skin diseases. I'm Douglas Tiragero, and I'm a physician assistant that practices in Rome, Georgia. And I'm Megan Anderson. I'm a physician assistant that practices in Ames, Iowa. So let's start with an overview of some of the more urgent cases that we can see in our practice. With erythroderma, you know, patients can be uh, have widespread erythema, they can have scaling, usually affects more than 90% of their body. Um, there can be systemic symptoms with that as well um, and can be life-threatening. With Steven Johnson syndrome, it's mostly, uh, as you know, initiated by drugs, mm -hmm. you know, as our number one culprit. Uh, sometimes infections can do this as well. But uh, we, send, we see separation of the skin. If it's less than 10%, I think that the, the guidelines say it's probably SJS. If it goes greater than 30%, and we're looking at uh, TEN, that toxic epidermal necrolysis. So this is an important one to realize. These are very fragile, fragile skin presentation, you know, blister formation, Nikolsky sign, pushing the skin, tearing the skin with very minimal ma manipulation. So it's an important one for us to have on this list, I agree. Yeah. And there's also GPP, which is generalized pustular psoriasis. So patients with this condition can present with widespread pustules. It can occur if they've already had psoriasis or it can occur if they've never had psoriasis. So let's look at the pathogenesis between GPP and plaque psoriasis. So as you can see, there are two different pathways with GPP. IL-36 is the main driver and with plaque psoriasis, it's IL-17 and IL-23. I think it's really important for us to talk about what really constitutes something being urgent, you know, in, in the dermal clinic. That's always the big joke with my colleagues. It's like somebody has a bad acne flare or a bad wart, you know, and they come in. But, you know, we're talking about things that could potentially be life-threatening. So, you know, when I think of urgent cases, I think of something when someone comes in and there's multi-system involvement. Mm -hmm. You know, they may have joint problems. They may run a fever. They may have ar arthralgias and uh, stomach complaints. And it's like it's multi-system. I mean, they, they, they look sick. Right. Part of it's just an overall gestalt. The patient just looks like they're really ill. They may be uh, presenting just saying, you know, I, I feel like my skin's a little bit tender, but there's not an eruption yet. Or I feel like my joints are a little bit achy, so I'm not really sure what's going on. And so I think there's a high uh, level of clinical suspicion that needs to take place and to say, look, the, you may be okay right now, but you're showing symptoms of something potentially being more serious. And so if you're seeing them in the clinic, you need to let them know. You need to return right away. You know, this needs to be something that you, you do not ignore. Or, uh, or get yourself into uh, an urgent care center if things, if things get worse. So I know when, you know, these patients come into our clinic, sometimes it can be hard to differentiate, you know, what is actually going on based on their skin findings alone. Sometimes there's widespread erythema. Sometimes they just have joint pain. So it's really hard to know initially maybe what the patient is presenting with. So sometimes it's... Um, nice to go through different real life case studies and see you know what the patient presented with and what the diagnosis ended up being so let's look at this case with a patient uh, we're going to call nancy she's 67 year old female presents widespread erythema right pustules fever fatigue neutrophilia had a sal a thallium test stress test on one week prior to her symptoms okay mm -hmm. two month history of widespread erythema Confluent on her back, legs, and mitten on her arms, pustules in all these areas, has been to the ER two separate times, treated with antibiotics and corticosteroids with each visit. Multiple comorbidities, breast cancer, arthritis, hypertension, and so the differential diagnosis begins to be all the things we've talked about, GPP, yeah. infections, AGEPT, all those things are things that we should consider. When patients present to the ER with these conditions, they see a pustule and they think, you know, Steven Johnson's or infection. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of take me through your thought process on how you would develop a differential for this patient. Well, uh, let's talk about infection first then. Can systemic infection, you know, like maybe uh, someone has got some type of sepsis that's beginning to present itself and they're having skin findings from it. Just means that we want to do a culture. You want to culture the lesions themselves. And if you can do a blood culture, then great. But those are things that take time. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to have a higher uh, level of suspicion to thinking to yourself, does it, could this be an infectious presentation with widespread pustules? You know, what, what things do that? I mean, how many yeah. things just create a widespread pustule? 
over a good portion of, of the body, you know, confluent on the back, the extremities. There's not many things that do that. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's an infected hair follicle, if it's a cellulitic presentation, you're not going to see this presentation. So I just think clinically it doesn't match up with an infection on the skin. Whether or not they have something going on internally, you could say, well, it's a fever, so maybe they've got something going on. But normally when you have sepsis, you're not going to have the, these, these same skin findings. So yeah. I think infection is, is going to be low on my list unless okay. infection was an initiating event prior to it, you know. Yeah. Um, and as far as, you know, you rule out infection, you know, the patient's ob obviously, you know, going downhill, what would your next steps be in regards to diagnosing this patient? Well, again, if we're in an urgent care setting and we can get things pretty stat, and we've already seen some of this data that we have on her case, we're going to look at lab values, you know. Um, you know, if things to help us differentiate. Well, if we see a large increase in eosinophils, you know, and and in the blood count, then you're thinking maybe more of a drug, a drug, drug yeah. type uh, eruption there. You know, if you see more of a neutrophilic shift, you know, kind of a left shift, then it may point you towards things that are neutrophilic and their etiology, which is gener generalized pustular psoriasis. Yeah. So I think we'd also would tend to see more of an elevation in CRP with GPP than we would with some of the other other things that we've mentioned. There are subtle clues that you have to slow yourself down as you're, if you're trying to really kind of pick through these. But the major thing is a, a left shift with neutrophils versus eosinophils as kind of a more of a major differentiator between primarily drug going on here or primarily a neutrophilic uh, disorder going on. Yeah. And one thing that we have, you know, the benefit of being in dermatology is biopsies. You know, mm -hmm. the skin is very accessible. We can take a little, you know, specimen and send that in. The important thing with biopsies is that they can take anywhere from a day to seven days to get yeah. back. So you can't wait, you know. It's important to get that for a confirmatory diagnosis a few days down the road mm -hmm. to kind of have that cooking. But your clinical suspicion has got to be you're thinking about these things even ahead of the biopsy, far ahead of the biopsy. So I think it's good clinical practice to get it, but it's not good, good clinical practice to send someone home who seems like they're urgently ill and tell them I'll call you in five to seven days when I get it back and let you know if we need to do something else. That's not the way to handle this. All right, Doug, so let's take it back to the case. What happened with Nancy? Uh, good question. We don't want to leave Nancy hanging. So if I work through my thoughts with Nancy, her blood work did show a neutrophilic shift, so that points towards GPP. Yeah. All right. Her biopsy did come back showing that there was uh, Monroe abscesses, uh, neutrophilic infiltration, so it tended towards that. Now, that's the information we would have gotten later on. When we looked at her other labs, she had an elevation in CRP. Mm -hmm. So these, these things are starting to line up. When we talk about other comorbidities, how does that help us? You know, when we tend to see subcorneal pustular dermatoses, um, that tends to follow folks that have hemato hematologic disorders, mm -hmm. um, even some cancer disorders, and that's not part of her list of things that are going on. But the key to me to saying that this was GPP, and this was, this case was generalized pustular psoriasis, is looking at the fact that she was treated with steroids, and then yeah. when the steroids wore off and you had a steroid withdrawal, her symptoms of erythema and widespread pusture uh, presentation came back. And that's, that's really a key, uh, a key diagnosis in that history to me that pointed, you know, pointed towards that. So this was a patient with generalized pusture psoriasis. Okay, so given the challenges of diagnosing GPP, what would be your recommendations for a non-dermatology provider, if one of these patients presents to them in their clinic or in the hospital, um, what would you recommend they do? Well, um, phone a friend is always <laughs> the way to go. Yeah. Um, for someone who's not doing dermatology uh, on a regular basis or full time, certainly the dermatology consult is critical. I mean, you may not be able to get that consult sending them to someone's office right away, but um, I would encourage folks that are in this urgent care, primary care, internal medicine, even OBGYN or uh, ER doc, get on the phone, you know, talk, uh, call, call the clinic and say, I got something uh, really weird going on here. Just want to kind of pick your brain. Um, but certainly as a follow-up coming out of that setting, if the patient's become stabilized, you don't think it's life-threatening, then do you want to strongly encourage and make that uh, derm consult? But to be honest with you, Megan, I mean, we have a lot of colleagues that are brand new to dermatology. So yeah. they could be in dermatology, and my answer would still be, you may want to still consult with someone that's in your clinic, that's, that's has more experience than you, you know, whether that's calling uh, a collaborative a physician or calling a, an NP or PA that's got a lot more experience than you do. So I think either way, 
when you're dealing with something that we consider rare and life-threatening, is what we're talking about, mm -hmm. you never go wrong, no matter how many years you've practiced, to say, hey, come give me a, a second opinion on this. And there's always things that in the panic of a situation you don't really think about or consider. Mm -hmm. And so uh, two's better than one. And, uh, and this is certainly one of the things we're talking about that's, that's more important than ever. Yeah, I agree. All right, so let's talk about another case. But uh, let's make this case something that really shows how serious uh, and potentially life-threatening a GPP can be. Um, she had diffuse coalescing and isolated pustules and extensive erythema involving the face, neck, trunk, groin, and upper and lower extremities. She had significant edema of the face, the trunk, and extremities as well. Histologic sections demonstrated subcorneal and intraepidermal spongiform pustules, all consistent with a diagnosis of GPP. And as you can see from these pictures, it is very extensive, very widespread. Yeah, she looks pretty ill. I mean, this, yeah. this, uh, it, there's no surprise that a patient with this presentation is in the ICU because they're going to need that, that, that support. So what would be your priorities with this patient in terms of what are the, what are the, right, yeah. the things that we need, need, need to address and need to know about? Yeah, that's a very good question. So first and foremost, you want to stabilize her, clear the pustules, get her comfortable, get her out of that critical zone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was alarming to me as I began to read more about GPP to see that the mortality rate for this in some studies is, is at 2%, and in other, uh, it's been 16%. And that's, that death is typically going to come from cardiac, you know, arrest, you know, respiratory distress, or sepsis. Mm -hmm. And so, um, as you said, we need to be uh, watching for all three of those, of those uh, potential problems developing. So is GPP always something that is life-threatening, or are there different variations of it? Well, it has the potential to always be life-threatening during its flares, but I think it's important to realize that the GPP is a chronic condition that is remitting and relapsing, which means it's going to have times when flares are going to present, but it's going to have kind of the valleys in between. Mm -hmm. And it may be that in our clinics, we're going to be seeing patients in valleys, and they're just going to be telling us a story about the flare. And again, it's, it's raising that clinical suspicion to say, okay, tell me a little bit more about that. Because what you may see in the clinic may just be some uh, widespread erythema or not even widespread, maybe an increase in scaling, maybe just a few pustules. And so I think that it's important to realize that because this condition is ongoing, um, because of its chronicity, that it's not always going to be this ICU presentation, mm -hmm. this 80% uh, of the body covered with pustules everywhere. And so uh, to get that diagnosis of, of GPP to help them out before they get to the next flare, we need to be thinking about it during those times when it's not as severe as maybe some of the things we've just talked about. And how often are you seeing these patients in follow-up? You know, you get the flare under control. You know, what's the follow-up look like? Well, I don't think any of us see a lot of GPP because of how rare yeah. it, it can be. It's not like I, uh, every Friday is my, is my GPP clinic day. Yeah. I've only seen three to five cases because they've been the severe presentations. I don't know how many times I've missed it when it's been the, the, the presentation that's more mild and I just didn't have it on my radar. So I think to answer your question, what do you do in between when you know it's GPP? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing is a lot of patient education to say, look, you've got this disease. This is what it is. These are the triggers, even though um, you, know, you may not have, uh, have had an ICU experience with this. It can have that, so it's important to realize that when you start feeling like you're running a fever, starting to see pustules, beginning to have some arthralgias, beginning to have some skin pain, anything along those lines that you immediately get in to be seen. So I think the biggest thing is patient ed education. And then I think another good point is, you know, follow up with the patients, you know, like you were mentioning, educate them. So if they do get some pustules, they know to call you right away and you already have that kind of in the back of your mind and you're one step ahead of the game. Right, and, and since we know that one of the major triggering factors is use of steroids for and to educate them, say, look, if you go somewhere, like in ER, they like to use steroids to treat things. Yeah. The steroids are helpful. Steroids is our friend, you know? Mm -hmm. But you've got to realize that, uh, that with this disease, it could potentially be detrimental. That's why we kind of, you know, when we teach at primary care clinics and, and to primary care residents that rotate, we, we kind of say, look, you know, 
you need to use this with a lot of caution because when this wears out of the system, this can precipitate a flare of a number of different skin disorders, and GPP is certainly the top of that list. So, Doug, we know that when patients are flared, obviously there's a huge impact on their quality of life. They're in a lot of pain. Um, you know, between flares, can you kind of take us through, you know, what patients might go through as far as, you know, their quality of life, even when they're not having a, an extreme flare of their pustular psoriasis? You know, there there's sometimes I, I deal with patients with severe disorders, and in my mind, I say, wow, that's got to be so difficult to live with, you know, and it and I, I think that in between flares, the, you know, s surveys and studies uh, that, that talk to patients who live with this disease, uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but, but they, they do say this. When you're living between flares, a lot of anxiety. Yeah. It's a lot of fear of the next flare, you know, because it, you know, they can look up things online. They can see that this is a, a uh, skin disease that uh, carries a potential of mortality with it. So you can imagine living with that. Uh, it can uh, depression is associated with this, uh, with this disorder, with this diagnosis. Uh, certainly, panic, um, uh, panic and uh, anxiety uh, disorder associated with it, and it's all related to when's it going to happen again? Mm -hmm. Am I going to be near uh, adequate health care if it does? Right. And so I think it's important to let our, our patients know. You know, I think you can recognize the symptoms and, and quite honestly, you're going to be able to probably educate the people that, that have to see you that are going to help you with this and educate family members, you know. So I think that uh, it's important to realize that the quality of life uh, is not very high in non-flare times either. That's why it's important to support them, to let them know we're here for you. So. Yeah, I agree. I mean, like we mentioned before, there's not a lot of you know, patients that have this condition and everything you were saying reminds me of the one patient that I have that had GPP. I mean, initially they were calling the office almost daily. Every time I saw the patient, they were concerned with, is this gonna come back? I don't want this to come back. Like, please don't let this come back. You know, they wanted to go visit family. They were worried that if they left, you know, they would have a flare or just calling, you know, I think I have another pustule coming in. It's not. You know, so it's kind of a lot of hand holding in the beginning, and it's it's understandable because the flares are so severe, they're they're awful. Mm -hmm. So as we were discussing before, this is a very rare condition. You know, there are a lot of providers that are in practice for five, ten years. They never see this, but it is something that we need to be aware of with how life-threatening it can be. I think that's important. I think that uh, generalized posture psoriasis is grossly underdiagnosed. People go years before they get the right answer. Uh, the flares are grossly underappreciated and are not recognized, underrecognized. Um, and so it's important for us, even if you don't see this disorder, the, the summary that I would say to our colleagues is that if you're not seeing this disorder in its full florid presentation, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that you can't potentially save a person's life by knowing about it, by knowing what questions to ask. You may get the phone call from the ER doc. You may get a phone call from another colleague that's in your practice that says, I got something weird going on. And so you've got the potential through your own education, you know, to, to really uh, in, intervene. And uh, mm -hmm. yes, it's rare. It, yes, it's distinct and different from psoriasis, right? Um, and it has that life threatening potential and it has, you know, a quality of life impact even between flares. So, you know, that's kind of the yeah. summary of what we've been saying. Mm -hmm. But the, the important thing is, is that um, don't miss it. Now that you know about it, you know, don't, don't, don't miss it. And once you see it, you have to act quickly. Well, thanks a lot for taking the time to discuss this rare condition with me. I had a lot of fun, and I did learn a little bit more about GPP. And I'm, ho I'm hoping all of you did as well. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here, and thank you for joining us on Dermcast TV. Yes, thank you.